It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all here. Uh, I wanted to answer one question before uh, I introduce Dave. Uh, people have been asking why has Harvard Law School chosen to host OSCOM? And uh, so I thought I'd offer you an explanation. Uh, I had the pleasure of being uh, at the first OSCOM meeting in Zurich and then the second one uh, at Berkeley. Uh, when we formed the Berkman Center, uh, which is now, I don't know, five years old at this point, the core idea was a recognition that the most fundamental border in this new space that we were exploring was between the open and closed, between the proprietary and the commons. Uh, the thought at that point was that as you looked forward to the future, you could see uh, the shape of the cathedral and the bazaar, and it was a matter of both the law and politics as to how that border would eventually work its way out. And as we looked at that border, it seemed that the forces that were <clears throat> organized on the proprietary side were extremely well organized and extremely well funded and that if there was some role for a little center like ours to play it would be in paying attention to that border exploring its nuances and helping if we could to organize on the other side at least contribute to it that's certainly the way see things seem to have unfolded. As you look at the world today, you can get an even greater sense of how the singularity of major powers uh, come to bear. We seem to be in an environment that's both politically and in terms of code organized more and more in that fashion. Uh, and so when the first OSCOM conference came onto the agenda, it seemed to me that here was the point of a spear. Here was, here was a, an expression of this quite extraordinary coding movement that starts at the operating system level and is working its way up. And in particular, what I was attracted to with OSCOM was its appeal to institutional entities as potential customers. Uh, organizations that would have the technical capacity to embrace uh, open uh, code. And uh, that seems to be the way it's developing. Uh, as you look to a future trajectory, if it follows the trajectory that we've seen so far with OSCOM, it's very promising. It's, it looks like you will find your market, you will reach your market, and you will truly compete. There's nothing that seems to me to have been more validating than the uh, recent stories about Microsoft's very large fund that it uses to discount any competition coming from developing nations or uh, major institutions who are <clears throat> interested in going the open source route. I mean, this. This is the evidence that open source is here and is growing and is strong. So that's why we were interested and continue to be interested in the trajectory of OSCOM and there are wonderful, wonderful places to go from here. So with that, let me introduce Dave Weiner. Dave Weiner, I have a feeling uh, many of you know very well uh, I'm going to make just the briefest of introductions. Dave Weiner, as far as I have come to know him, is a force of nature. He is just action. You put him in a place and you get interactivity. So we're looking for interactivity here. Dave is the king of the blog world. He is the number one uh, blogger in any number of different ways. And so without further ado, I give you Dave Weiner. Well, I couldn't possibly have had a better introduction. Um, thank you, Charlie. And um, I had a whole list of things that I was going to talk about, but I moved something after listening to the intro. 
I could barely contain myself because I don't agree with anything he said. Okay? Um, and my theme, my thesis, what I'm here to urge all of you to do is to find ways to work with each other, not to build these walls that say it's us versus them. Labels like proprietary, closed, those are terrible labels. It's a terrible thing to say about somebody, that they're proprietary or they're closed. So think about that. If you want to find acceptance in the world for your ideas, look for people that you can make friends with, not alienate. Now, I'm like everybody else that was on the stage, or I, well, I should say more accurately, I was like everybody else that was on the stage when I was an active software developer, because I'm not, at this point, an active software developer, in that I did some open source, and I did some what I call commercial software. And I much prefer the term commercial to closed or proprietary because actually my commercial software, I released most of the source code for it. Um, however, you didn't have the right to do anything other than customize it, look at it, understand how it works, report bugs based on having looked at the source code. You weren't given the GPL type rights of you know, redistributing or competing with me based on that code. But I was basically willing to trust my customers um, with the source code, knowing that very few of them actually placed any value at all on having the source code. They were buying the functionality. They weren't buying access to the source code. And, you know, that's proven out. We first released the product uh, Frontier that had the source code included, first released that in 1992, January 1992, long before there was any buzz about, you know, open source or anything like that. And we went through, we've been through a terrible period in the software industry with all the noise that people make about open source, and it's been really destructive. Um, there's been a tendency in the open source community to see it as Microsoft versus you. And when you do that, you miss everything that's in between. And there's a lot, and there's a lot of really good stuff in between. And we're not your enemy. We don't behave like Microsoft. We behave a lot more like you than we behave like Microsoft. We have a lot of the same issues. Um, they tend, the big companies tend to dominate us, tend to crush us, tend to not care at all about what we think. Um, and it's hard to get people to actually pay attention to what you're doing. And when the open source stuff came around, um, when all that hype was rushing through, it became even harder. It became much harder because our customers were being told that we were robber barons, that we were stealing from them. And you know what? That doesn't really help you build a good business. You know, in fact, if your customers are saying that you're stealing from them or you're, you're holding, withholding something important, I mean, this is what the open source movement was saying to our customers. Well, you know, it's not going to make you too many friends when you do that. Um, and and when, you, when you really, really dig into it and try to find the philosophy of open source, well, it was in the 90s was supported by a rather artificial stock market. Okay? There was a venture capital support for this idea that you could give stuff away and somehow make money, give everything away and somehow make money. And then there were a few IPOs. But then when the dust settled on that, what you ended up with is people doing the mixture of open source and proprietary, or open source and commercial. And so everybody's doing the same thing anyway. So let's get rid of the lines and let's start working with each other. You know, we have a lot of the same issues. We are the same people, <laughs> so why shouldn't we work with each other? So anyway, um, I came with a lot of things that I can talk about. Um, and as John quoted me yesterday, if, I, if you let me drone, I will bore you. So um, interrupt, feel free. Uh, Charlie has, do you have a microphone? Charlie can, you know, as soon as you raise your hand, Charlie's going to zip up there and he's going to stick the mic in your face and you're going to get a chance to talk. So, you know, sort of think of this as kind of like a live blog, right? I just have a bunch of things that I'm going to start writing about and I've got a little comment section there and you guys can, you know, post comments in there if you like. So at this point, does anybody have anything they want to say or a question they want to ask? Yeah, right here, Joseph. This is Joseph Regal from MIT. I know some of the people here, so I can say who you are. Right, so uh, we might want to cut this short because talking about terminology, what it really means, can take lots of time and not really go anywhere productive. But I just wanted to point out that the word proprietary really wasn't used by the open source community at first. 
it was a good word. People said, we have these proprietary technologies, and it's a good thing that you'll want to buy. Yeah, yeah. So when, in turn, we use that word to differentiate ourselves. But, Joseph, does it really differentiate you, or does it differentiate your software? Are you fundamentally different from somebody who produces proprietary software? Let me ask you another question. Have you ever produced proprietary software? No. Okay. Um, would I, you ever consider doing it? Uh, I would consider it because I appreciate your point. I mean, people that know me know I'm not one to uh, pigeonhole people and paint myself into a corner. I try to collaborate and work with lots of different people. But I think the open source response might be, well, we didn't invent that word. We had to define ourselves in some way. And the commercial or proprietary, whatever you want to call it, they get to market. They get to do strategic. They what? They get to market, they get to brand themselves, they get to act strategically, and c can't the open source community do the same? I, I don't recall, I, you know, I go back to the beginning of the personal computer software market. Uh, I was a software developer when there were no personal computers. And I don't recall any company saying, we're gonna identify ourselves as being proprietary. That never happened. Actually, what people did was they focused on ease of use and accessibility and bringing the technology to the people. Now, I was hearing things at the panel yesterday, the user panel, and I spoke about this briefly, is that these people need that kind of help. They need what I think of as the 40-person software company that doesn't exist anymore, that used to exist. Not two or three people with a service business on the, on the side, 40 people producing something in shrink wrap that's intended to be for the masses, for lots and lots of people. So you get the kind of investment there that you can't get from an open source project and you can't get from something that Microsoft produces or some very large company or a database or an enterprise company. This doesn't even exist anymore, yet it was a really, really good form factor for a company or for a development team. You had some people who were doing support, some people doing quality assurance, some people writing docs, a few people doing some marketing. So in this day and age, you'd have the website would be updated every once in a while and somebody would be working on ease of use. You know, we've kind of lost our way. I mean, if you think the stuff that we're producing today is easy to use, go back and look at some of the stuff that was produced in the 80s that is no longer being maintained. Um, and if you think it wasn't really great engineering, I wrote a product that shipped in 1986 for the Macintosh that still runs on today's Macintosh. I wrote a product in the 80s for the PC that still runs on today's Windows. So, you know, along underneath it, if you, and another thing, if you think that because it's easy to use, it's not hard to write, you're totally mistaken. It's a lot harder to write something that's easy to use. A lot harder. Yet, users tend to trivialize stuff that they can use. They look with respect at Unix and say, oh, that must be really hard to write because I can't use it. But the opposite is true. It's relatively easy to write a Unix-style operating system. Um, so, you know, Hallie. Hi, um, I'm Hallie Suit from Hallie's Comment, my blog. You can find me there. I have a background that's in sales and marketing, so I'll come clean and say that right up front. And I've asked this question, I'm going to ask Dave, but I've asked Doc Searles this question, I've asked Eric Raymond this question, which is, um, you know, when you talk about wanting to work with people closely, it seems to me, for instance, like, what does Linux even look like? What I've never Linux even like? seen it. I don't see it around. I, it, there's a penguin. It's like, okay, is there a gigantic non-sales and marketing effort going on around open source? For well, there some actually reason is. I'm missing. Uh, and if somebody kind of gets hip to that, comes in and adds that piece, are they just going to not work with everybody f in a friendly way, but just wipe this out? I okay, wonder. I want to take that somewhere. I have somewhere I want to go with that. Um, <laughs> What? Oh, that's, I finally oh, saw that, it. That's what Linux looks like. My Linux virginity, it's gone. Okay. Well, why don't, okay, I want, you should sit down, okay? Thank you very much. And, and Charlie, could you get out in the audience with the microphone so people don't feel they have to, you know, we're, we're trying to keep this really interactive. Yes, sir. Um, well, one of the things I have in my list to talk about is something called the Linux Advocacy How-To, which I think is a masterpiece. And if you want to look and see how open source, in my opinion, should be talking to the rest of the world, that's it. It's a very humble document. Uh, I have a phrase that I, I wrote a DaveNet essay about this a few years ago, and 
people roast me for this one, but I stand by it. The title of the piece was, We Make Shitty Software. And the, the statement was, is I'm not going to stand up here and tell you my software doesn't have bugs in it, and it doesn't crash, and it doesn't lose data. But we're trying to make it better, okay? And so for, uh, you shouldn't feel like you're out there and nobody knows. Like, we're having this debate right now with a poor guy who I know very well, uh, Robert Scoble, who just took a job as an evangelist at Microsoft. Um, and I love Robert. He's a very good friend of mine. And going to Microsoft was the right move for him. He totally fits in there. And he stuck his foot in his mouth and asked for user feedback on Microsoft Internet Explorer. And <laughs> so he's getting it <laughs> in great doses. And, um, and there's a case of a product where the users are completely stranded. You know, the product has bugs, but to the extent that there's a development team still around on that product, they don't acknowledge that the bugs exist. So we start from, I know I've drifted from your question, but you actually have seen what Linux looks like now. Um, but that, that, it's, it, that we have so much work to do in the software world, why put up the walls? Let's all, you know, again, I keep coming back to this, let's work together. So the Linux advocacy how-to actually says all the, the same kinds of things that I just said, is that our software sucks and we know it, but we're trying to make it better, okay? And so you avoid the flame wars, you avoid the religious wars, you don't have to ever have an argument with anybody who says your software sucks because I agree with your statement, right? So um, that also raises another, I want to tell a little story. Um, this was an experience that I had designing XML RPC. Does everybody know what that is? Or uh, raise your hand if you do know what XML, okay. And so it's safe to assume people do. Um, the design for that was done in a space of like two weeks. And I made one trip up to uh, Redmond and uh, met with Bob Atkinson and Mohsen Algozain and Don Box. At the time, Don didn't work at Microsoft, but he does work at Microsoft now. And we had this wonderful collaboration on this protocol, which now, by the way, there's an O'Reilly book on it. It is the darling of the open source world. Eric Raymond says that this is totally in philosophy with everything he believes in, and it is. Um, it just shows, by the way, that Engineers are engineers no matter where they work. Uh, Atkinson and Eric Raymond, if they sat together had dinner, they would find they have a lot in common, a lot that they agree on, a lot of interests they share. Um, obviously, because Aaron, Eric, whether he knows it or not, is a fan of what Bob did. So the philosophy we had in the design of this thing was backwards. It was different from every other project I've ever been involved with. The philosophy was, I'm going to try to do whatever you ask me to do. Unless there's some reason I absolutely can't do it, I'm going to do it. Okay? So if somebody said, I think the spec should have a provision for this in it, okay? Well, that would probably end up in the spec. <laughs> Unless somebody found a reason why it wouldn't work. But the rules were you weren't allowed to be gratuitous about that. You actually had to have a reason why it wouldn't work. So what happened was people clammed up. They said, wait a minute. If I say this should be in there, it's going to be in there. And so the thing stayed simple, it stayed understandable. And that, in my opinion, is the secret of the success of XMRPC. That's why it worked so incredibly well, is that it isn't overloaded with complexity. They're never, it turns it around. It's like people, instead of having to argue for your own ideas, you kind of have to argue against them. <laughs> and two weeks, after, two weeks into this process, it was ready to go. And it hasn't really changed, changed slightly when Python came on board in about a year later, uh, Frederick Lund, who was doing the Python work at the time, uh, asked for a base 64 binary type and some clarification on a few things. And, and except for that, and that was in 1999, so it's already four years ago, the thing has not changed since then. And so a, a remarkable way if you turn the, and I've never found anybody that was willing to work that way since. And every project I've ever been involved with where the idea is to reach some kind of consensus, you always end up with a lot of powerless people fighting with each other to be heard. You know, uh, and a good example is the SOAP 1.2 working group had something like 500 people on it. And, you know, where they'd have, probably would have to have a meeting in a room like this um, to actually, I don't know, Sam, you probably know about how that works now. Sam Ruby works at IBM. I know him through the SOAP community. Um, okay. Anybody want I've, Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, Tony Byrne from CMS Watch, and I, I just have a couple of 
of quick comments. Uh, first, I think I would dispute the notion that there aren't successful 40-person software firms. Okay. Uh, there are quite a few in the CMS space. They are, in fact, I believe the most successful ones and are probably their success is a big part of what is, um, yes, but they I, don't I think, fit my model. I, I didn't actually say what the model is. They're, are they producing shrink wrap software or enterprise software? Are they consulting? So, no, sorry, it's shrink wrap. It's shrink wrap it's shrink server wrap. software. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and how do they uh, distribute? Well, you've got you. you many of them uh, distribute through resellers, direct channel, um, and okay. some of the more successful ones are ASPs. Okay. Uh, and in this, their very success is, in fact, I believe, putting a kind of a of a ceiling on the open source movement, which sort of take open source CMS movement. Which actually takes me to my second comment, which is sort of in line a little bit with what Halley was getting at, which is that it seems to me there's a fundamental difference uh, between developing software for other developers, which is really, and, and system administrators, which is what Linux and Apache are all about. It's a great leap to go from there that because those products are coming to dominate their space if they haven't already, um, to then go, well, then it's the natural course of history here that that open source content management systems are, are the wave of the future. Is, and the fundamental difference, it seems to me, is in the users of the system. The people who play with Apache and Linux are other developers and sysadmins. Well, okay, can I pick it up from there? Sure. Because I have lots that, I'll try to say not that much about it. Um, I think the key is to become a user yourself. And don't try to develop software that you yourself wouldn't want to use because you're never gonna have the right point of view about it. You're never gonna understand what the users are saying and that's one of the things I've been trying to do. I mean, I, that's all the successes I've ever had have been that way, where you know I couldn't do presentation software without actually doing presentations myself. I couldn't do outlining software without being an outlining guy. Um, the ideas just wouldn't make any sense. I wouldn't, if I were listening to a user, I wouldn't know uh, what they meant I, if I didn't speak their language. Uh, now, you can clone somebody else's product without being a user in the category. That's certainly doable. But if you want to be at the leading edge and start doing things that nobody is doing, which, by the way, the open source community simply hasn't done. It hasn't done any of that. Uh, and I think for really good reasons. Um, but, uh, and by the way, this is, I've been, this, I, at Berkman, um, which is where I work now, um, there's, there's a lot of, I'm trying to be kind of delicate, but there's people that, like Charlie, for example, who think that the word, Charlie, the first time I ever met him, said, what is this guy doing here? You know, because <laughs> the philosophy I'm still wondering. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's okay. But we still, you know, accept each other, right? I mean, it, 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 somebody said, it's good to have somebody here that doesn't agree with us, right? And, and that's the sort of the academia at its best. Um, is that, that just the act of discussion is a good thing. And, and that's the wonderful thing about Harvard Law School is that it's kind of a wacky place that way. They try out new ideas. And I, I think as I'm you know, sort of getting familiar with what's going on here, I get, get the idea that Berkman is actually a really good fit even though it's so kind of weird. You know? um, but when I listen to people say they want open source, okay, I try to poke through that and say, well, what is it that they really want? Right? Because I don't think... Forgive me, Charlie, okay? I don't think you actually want my source code. I don't think you would do anything useful with it if you had it. I would be happy to give it to you if you want, but I don't see what you... I think you want something else and haven't found a way to articulate it. So that I'm trying to tease that out of you and everybody else that, you know, do you want freedom? Do you want not to be locked in? Do you want to have lots of choice? Do you want developers to be creative? What is it that you want from open source? I, I'd like to hear from a user about this. Or, and Charlie would be okay if you wanted to say something. Great. Oh, by the way, just before you go, I want to try to be concise and quick, okay? Because I want to keep it moving, so try not to make a speech, all right? One of my concerns about the term open source is that it sort of puts the cart before the horse. I think Richard Stallman actually had it right when he says that what's important are the freedom, or the freedoms that are associated with the right to create copies, to make derivative works, to distribute copies and derivative but works. And does the, the user code, want to do any of that stuff? And the source code is only an enabler for that. So what is it that the source code is enabling exactly? Just it is a, a, you, you can't 
productively and effectively create derivative works, for example, okay. if what okay. you have to I do want, is I want a word engineer. or a phrase, Larry, okay? A word or a phrase. What is it that enables you to do? It enables me to obtain derivative works. I'm no longer a programmer. I okay, okay. Be. I understand. That, that's a good – anybody have another answer they want to chime in on this? Yeah, Aaron, give the, give the mic to Aaron. Oh, uh. the, the standard short version is, is the unwelded uh, automobile hood. So, pardon me? The, the automobile hood not welded shut. I don't want analogies. I want answers. What is it that you want? What I want is the insurance that my software will continue to work and I can get somebody to fix it. That might be me. It might be Brent. Okay. If it breaks. I would say that you don't – I would summarize this saying you don't want to be locked in. Sure. That you want to make sure, and let me, let me try to articulate that and then and ask Aaron to go, is that, and I as a user want this as well, okay? I don't want my data in your format, okay? I want my data in an open format so that I can switch software at any time that I want to do that. I didn't need the source code to do that, by the way. Absolutely, give them the mic back. But switching software is a big cost to no, if one the, small No, problem. it is not a big cost if the data is works in both software products, it's really easy. But what if it's a big application, like a word processor? What's that the problem? Like somebody here doesn't like that. Pardon me? Ah, okay, exactly. there's, okay, he says it's, training no, costs. but now I think a reasonable person would have to agree that it's not only about retraining, it is also about data, correct? No, sir, not in Excel, for example. Try to convert the data you've got in Excel. How are you going to do that? Open Office. What? Open Office. Open Office. Oh, I see. Does it read Excel files? This yes, guy it does. doesn't think it does. I mean, maybe they've changed. Maybe Microsoft's become kinder and gentler. But when I tried to reverse engineer their file format, I didn't get very far. I don't. I, th I felt they were putting Roblox in my way too. By the way, so yeah. I know. Okay. Bob is doing a wonderful job. All right. They, he says you got to line up at the microphone, and I'm sorry. My philosophy is I want a lively discussion first. If it gets webcast, that's great. Yeah, Aaron. Yeah, so the important thing, I think, is that you should be able to fix bugs when the developer goes bankrupt. You know, when they, you know, the bubble bursts. There you go. You're stuck, and you don't want to have to, you know, use a new program because you're used to this program. You just want to fix a few bugs. That, and I a think, is a legitimate concern, and thanks for raising that, okay? Did everybody understand what he was saying? Is that, okay, I produce a piece of software. You put your data in my software. Now I go bankrupt, and you, two years later, there's a new version of the operating system comes out, and your software doesn't run on it. Now what do I do? Oh, that's one possibility. So certainly people, he said source code escrow. Bob, how's that for a compromise? <laughs> source code escrow means that if you want people to use your product, then put the source code somewhere so that if you go out of business, they will feel that they are covered, that their bases are covered. Maybe that's a good to-do action list item to come out of this conference would be some way to do source code escrow. Because open source content management these days means there is some closed source around, right? Anyway, Sam. Same theme, different twist. I don't want to be stranded. Uh, IE is not necessarily evolving, as you pointed out. Wait, you don't want to be stranded? Strand, I mean, I put out a web log. Right. You've seen it. Of course. Um, it doesn't always look well in IE. I can't fix that. Correct. That's the problem I want to be able to address. I would agree with you. In fact, I would say that if Microsoft put their source code in escrow, I'd say now would be a good time to kick it out because they're clearly not doing any more work on this thing. In fact, I suggested that strongly as the remedy in the antitrust trial is that these guys should give up that application, that that should be the penalty for doing what they did in the market, that they shouldn't get to keep the application that they used to kill Netscape with. You know, it's sort of like having a murderer running around with a gun that he used to kill somebody. Hey, at least take the gun away from the guy. Uh, I'm, I'm going to answer your. I'm going to answer your question. Uh, whoa, 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 who's right there? Uh, oh, okay. Bruce, Bruce Who Tychowski are you, by the way? From, Bruce Tychowski from Harvard. Okay. Uh, my answer is I'm a I'm a user and I want an API, I, and uh, to me, open source uh, has a much better API, or or I can build an API in. Um, hmm. If I want to, how do you know that? I mean, isn't I mean I've worked on a few real software products. I guess I don't know. I mean, not to say I mean it's just not you know the, the internally they usually aren't that aren't things of beauty. They they aren't things that you know you want to 
I wouldn't. I mean, it requires a lot of investment to, to figure out how they work internally. I think of an API as being something you put on the outside of an application for the specific purpose that you're, you're looking for. Personally, I don't buy that as a reason for wanting this open, for needing or wanting the source. But does any, anybody agree or disagree strongly on that point? Okay. Who's next? Oh, Paul. Can I, uh, I'm Paul from Zope Europe. Uh, can I go back to the users and usability point? You can go back to anything you want. Uh, I think you've got a great point on that. And Tony recently wrote a really good piece on that that uh, some of you ought to go take a look at. Kind of a challenge for what we need to do better. And it comes back to a really dirty secret in the world of open source is the motivator. Uh, I wrote it because it solved my problem. Mm -hmm. This is the primary motivator. The secondary motivator is I published it because I like what other geeks think about me. About 47 motivators later, you get, oh, it's easy for the secretary to use. Yeah. But and, I, would, and, I thought and you were going to go somewhere. Software, commercial software works well at solving this problem because they have to rely on the money transaction with the secretary mm -hmm. to make it easy to use. And we need to do better about finding good motivators that reward ease of use. We also need to, and OSCOM is trying to do this, when we do find people that are good at it, we don't need to split it across 46 different projects. Yeah, no kidding. That was the thing that was Scarce astounding resources. about the user to the panel yesterday. Was yeah. all, and I think that's what you were getting at, or Charlie, is that somehow this needs to coalesce to be yeah. some one place for people to work as opposed to 85,000. Yeah. I thought you were going to say something else, though. When you said the second reason, I thought the second reason was going to be job security. That if I make it too easy for people to follow what I'm doing, then I can't charge the big consulting rates. Yeah. You know? I, I think most geeks aren't really thinking that far ahead. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but but as, the, as the business side of this, and, you know, we may, not, we may disagree over whether this is open source or not, but one thing I think is, is that it's an industry, okay? Yeah. Right? You know, somehow it defines itself, and maybe open source isn't necessarily the uh, philosophy that, that unifies everything, maybe there's, as it goes forward and people get tougher and mm -hmm. the competition gets tougher and, you know, they have to try out new ideas, I think that some of these problems are going to get solved. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I think both of your themes are really perfect for us to answer Tony's article. One, we need to put users first, yeah. and two, we need to be much better about working together. Yeah, before you give up the microphone, I want also to mention that you and uh, Gregor wrote a piece that I think is very on topic and very important about not arguing about data formats mm -hmm. and like getting behind some of the common data formats and stop reinventing the wheel mm -hmm. so that people, and uh, this is one of my big issues, is that yeah. people ought to have this interchangeability. You ought to have this ability to say, okay, I don't like where you're going with this piece of software. I'm going to switch and have all the data just work. Yep. You know? There's That's this selfish pretty... gene thing going on where I've got to create a three-letter acronym to pass on to the future generations. And uh, using your three-letter acronym doesn't let my selfish gene survive. Your standard or mine sucks either. I didn't write it. Yeah, and they, uh, I don't know who said this, but um, I know Newton, Isaac Newton said I'm something to the effect that I'm only great because I stand on the shoulders of giants, but in the software industry, we stand on each other's toes. And, you know, it makes it very, very difficult to be creative when you always have to anticipate some guy is just going to park right there, you know, and say, well, you know, you didn't actually do any work here. Somebody else invented this, and now I get to reinvent it because of that, you know. Yeah. I want to extend Paul's thoughts about uh, motivation. Well, my motivation to use open source is uh, not of being afraid of locking or something like that. It's just that I don't want to be on the consumer end of the barrel. I want to be a part of community, and I want to share and be shared with. Okay. Is that a requirement? Hmm? In other words, do you actually have to have the source code to be part of a community of users? Definitely. That's what Larry said about uh, to be part of a community, I want to be able okay. to do derivative work. I would disagree with that, but I understand that, that you feel that way. I mean, I think there are lots of communities where people wouldn't even know what source code is. You know, yet they collaborate and they work with each other and they help each other, they support each other and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, okay. I mean, I, you know, I accept your point of view. I mean, completely. Yeah. Well, um, I, oh, I, okay. I would like to turn the question around and ask, why should we use proprietary or in new terms commercial software? Um, okay, that's a fair question. Um, I don't think you should. Okay. 
How about that? I mean, I don't think you should use, and I want to, you know, of course, I, I have to, after the pregnant pause, I have to explain why. I don't think you should use any piece of software based on its religion or philosophy or anything like that. You should use it, and, and I, I felt this way about the Macintosh. I was one of the early Mac developers. I got my first machine in 84, and uh, 83, actually, before it was actually released, and I, I really didn't like this idea that, you know, we're holier than thou because we're not using character-based MS-DOS or whatever. We got this wonderful, it was terrible. In the end, you're just using a computer, okay? So if, I don't think you should ever use a piece of software because it's proprietary and I, and personally, would never use a piece of software because it's open source. I use, try to use software because it's a useful tool that helps me do what I like to do. That's only software, and emphasize that software is a tool, not a religion. If you're looking for a religion, there are lots of churches and synagogues and mosques and all the rest of that stuff. They do a much better job, in my, in my opinion. Yeah, right here. Yeah. Oh, you have the mic. Wow. How did that happen? Did um, you bring it with you? Well, uh, I... <laughs> name, I, please. Yeah. Uh, Bill Ahern from Washington, D.C. Um, Hi, Bill. I was trying to think of my question, what I was going to say, but... Um, in order for me to live in, in a democracy, don't I have to have the right to vote? I mean, I, I take issue with having to come up with specific reasons, reasons for using open source. Do we need specific reasons to live in democracy, or do we need, have to, you know, every time we go to the 7-Eleven, do we think, you know, why am I living in a free market? In order for open source, it's an ethos and it has to be internalized. So the questions we should be asking are, you know, how, you know, not how, you know, how, how do I convince this person or this person or that person to use open source, we should be asking questions like, how is democracy internalized? How, is free, how are free markets internalized? Interesting in, point. In, in, well, into why is it like walking into a 7-Eleven and buying something? I think it's like walking, I have to say, okay, I bought a house, right? This is where I live. And, but I have to let everybody live there with me. In other words, I paid a lot of money for this house. I worked years to do the down payment. I'm That's right. And, and every day, let me finish. I'm working every day to make the mortgage payments on this house. But I have to let everybody in this building live with me when they want to. And there are no, absolutely no rules about what they can do. They can do anything they want. How... That's what I think it's like. I don't think that would be a very nice world to live in. I'm, I live in that world today. It's called democracy and a free market. No, it's not. You democracy know, free markets can't allow, allow monopolies. Into my house. Democracies can't allow despots. Well, I mean, I, I so, believe me, I'm a full supporter of democracy. I, you know, I like to think that I've given too. I mean, you know, but I don't think that the analogy follows. I, I see that the work that I create, the things that I create, are mine, not yours. You don't have to use it. I'm not forcing you to use it. It may be a good thing for somebody else to use. I gather you wouldn't want to use it if I don't give you the source. Great. But what's the problem? Why do you have to tell me that I have to give you something that I created? That's not democracy. That's communism. I mean, I, maybe there's a little communism in democracy. Pardon me? I said, I said maybe there's a little communism in, 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 okay, in democracy. I buy that. I think there probably is. I wouldn't want to live in that world, I guess is what I'm saying. Yes. Uh, Brian, Brian Cortez. Um, I'd like to go back to the point about the uh, marketing angle where I've worked a lot with open source the community and it seems to me that there's this aversion to marketing yourself or, or, or making it into the, the, the commercial world saying here's what I have to offer because it's, it's equated with commercial software and that mindset and there's, there's this big aversion to you know, yeah. tooting your own horn, so to speak. Well, that's what I was talking about before. That's the flip side of it. Where our, we were running a commercial company, and our users were calling us war criminals because we were, you know, not doing whatever. And I, I think a lot of that is, is coming from the open source community itself. It's coming from the open source. Absolutely, that's where it was coming from. That's where they got the idea that we were criminals for doing what we were doing. I mean, I'm in a large corporation, and as one of the sole open source sort of um, people, and that's what I get from the business side is, well, you know, they don't, you know, what, what can they gonna offer me? What can I get in return, or as far as how much support am I going to get two years down the road when I'm locked into this software? And those are all reasonable, don't you think those are reasonable questions? Yes, I, 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 I do from a business standpoint. Yes, I do. How about just from a living standpoint? I mean, you know, you're, you're making an investment, right? Your time is worth something. The time you're going to put in this thing, 
So do, are you going to be, is it going to be okay? I mean, Sam, your issue was, you know, am I going to be able to fix the bugs? That may be enough. Okay, so, I'm sorry. Sam's issue was, will somebody be able to fix the bugs? And now you also have to consider, and I understand that, but you also have to consider, will anybody actually fix the bugs? Right? That's the other question you have to ask. A lot of open, there are a lot of source forge projects I don't think anybody's going to be fixing the bugs on. Right. Right. I use Apache, Apache server. Right. I've never submitted a patch to the Apache server. I've right, right. with Apache, but I feel confident that if there is a bug, there is somebody out there, possibly even in this audience, who will fix it. Right. Okay. So I, that's the type of software I want to select. The software. I use Apache too, by the way. Right. Software that will yep. still be around two, five years from now. Okay. Yep. Because somebody, not necessarily the original author, but somebody is still interested in fixing it. You know what? I think that may be our common denominator, Sam. Say it again. I want to pick software that will still be around two to five years year from now because somebody will right. still be interested in fixing it. Let's, that may not be me. That may be somebody else. You don't have to go that far. I mean, I want to use software that will still be around two to five years from now. Maybe we would go even further that we want to use software that will still be around 20 to 30 years from now, right? I mean, should we be aspiring to that? I mean, software has been around for, whatever, 50 years now, right? At this stage in the life of the art of software development, wouldn't it be reasonable to be thinking in those terms? You know, getting out of this mode of continually reinventing, trying to reinvent, or saying we've reinvented when we actually haven't reinvented. The world you know? five to 20 years from now may be a little different. So you need Pardon to me? The world five to 20 of years course. from now may be a little different. But you'd like to think that the software would adapt to the world 10 or 20 years from now, right? That Apache, I would be willing, I mean, how many people agree with this statement? That Apache will still be running 10 or 20 years from now. I think so, right? Okay, let me try another one, as, as distasteful as this may be. Will Windows still be running 10 or 20 years from now? Yeah. Obviously. So, is there merit to both systems? Obviously. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think you've latched on to an important point, that, but you're maybe asking the wrong audience of that. Why? Because you when seem you're like dealing, very reasonable people. No, no. That, <laughs> when you deal with people who are technically proficient and ask the question, they will come up with technical answers why open source is better. But when you ask a business person or a government person, or God forbid a lawyer who doesn't know anything about computers, what software they should use and why they should use it, they view open source as being the equivalent of a company that is in competition with Microsoft and they are trying to find alternatives that are cheaper, better, reliable, and not uh, and, and don't leave them beholden to a I company that they view as a... They're looking for what Sam is talking about. I, I, I'm agreeing with him. I think that it's important to look at it, as several other people have said here, to look at it from a business perspective. They don't give a damn about the source code. They want good software, right. and they don't want to be beholden to a company that they perceive as charging them too much and acting in monopolistic fashion. Okay, thank you. I, I get, I think you're right about that, absolutely. You know what I want as a developer? Let me, let me, let me try to um, explain this. Is that if I crack a nut, in other words, if I work for five years on a problem and I solve it, right? So let's say the problem that the users panel up here was talking about. I'd like people to look at it and think about it and ask the question, did he actually solve the problem? And if I did solve the problem, then give me credit for solving the problem. You know? Maybe you don't buy my software. Maybe you prefer to use open source. Maybe one way to acknowledge that I solved the problem is to clone my software. You know? Just to say, okay, solve the problem. How do you feel about us cloning it? Yeah, I'd rather if you used it, but if you have to, go ahead and clone it. That would be my answer. I looked at Apache as the competition for a product I did called Manila. And all the time I was working on Manila, which basically started in 1996, I was thinking somebody in the Apache group is going to catch on to what we're doing and build this stuff into Apache because it's just too obvious. This should be in Apache. When you install Apache, it should come up with an edit this page button to let you edit your website right there. You know, I mean, so we put the idea out there. No, it's not open source, so we don't even have to look at that. And that is humiliating. That, makes me so damn angry that somehow my work is less valuable 
when I'm doing what everybody else is going to be doing in a few years. What I'm doing is I'm charging some money for the software that I produce. But I'm not charging, by the way, I'm not charging for the ideas. I'm not putting patents on my software. And by doing that, of course, I'm putting stuff out into the genetic pool that nobody can patent, in theory at least. Yeah, over here. Oh, no, no, go over here, please. This man right here. I like fresh comments. I, I, if somebody's been sitting there going, oh, I kind of get, to, you know, basically what um, happened? My name's Mike Blonder right. from IMB Enterprises. From where? And IMB Enterprises. And I think your Manila product didn't make it because of radio user land. It made it. It made it. Okay. It well, I'm it. a user of radio get, user land. Get out of here. It, it made it. It's, in, it's the biggest Okay, well, I want to tell you, I'm a game user game. of Radio Userland, and I think the support, I could use an you expletive, but I won't do uh, it. You think what? I think you got a support issue. Oh, yeah. Tell me about it. Don't and you I got a documentation that. issue? I totally know that. You know why? Yeah, and, you know and B-Logger's got the same thing. Who does? B-Logger, whatever they're called. Blogger. Blogger. Yeah, we yeah, all do. Guess why? There's no damn money in software. There's no damn money That's in correct. software. That's correct. Okay. Right. We're I rest dead. my case. I We're think there's money in dead. software. Okay. I, you know, if that's why. It's because the software industry doesn't exist. We're trying to wish it into existence so that we can hire some support people to answer your questions. Thirty-nine ninety-five. You think we can answer a lot of questions for that? I wonder about that. You got to have a mic. Bob says you got to have a mic. Yeah, I'm sorry. You asked a great question. Thank you very much. I've been trying to say that, you know. It's like, let's have a damn industry. Let's support the users. Let's give them what they want. Let's not make a religious issue out of whether you like Richard Stallman or you like Bill Gates. You know, I don't like either of them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> neither of them take baths, by the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Right here. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's the sound bite, by the way. <laughs> I wonder if we could squeeze in just a little bit of uh, discussion about RSS and, and, oh, yeah. and how you feel like, you know, that fundamental plumbing is changing. Um, RSS stands for really simple syndication. Agree or disagree? <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure, that'll generate some disagreement. Um, it's a straight XML format or it's a subset of RDF. That'll generate some disagreement as well. I think that if somebody went back and traced through the history of RSS and actually read the archive of the various mail lists where all this stuff was discussed, if enough people did that, and I mean by enough I mean like five or ten people, not that many people. Actually, before they spouted off their opinion about the history, actually went back and read what was written at what time and what the sequence of events was and peeled that onion back. They would, we would go back before the 1.0 fork. Where's Denise? We were talking about this at lunch yesterday. Go back before that fork and let's get the world rational again, okay? Let's follow the path, you know, that, that happened, and, you know, gradually upgrade it. And, you know, what we would end up with is, had that happened, I don't think we would have ended up where RSS 2.0 is today. Um, and we've got, you know, never mind the sort of history for a moment, this question of where we are with RSS and what are the problems with it is that, you know, uh, uh, Joey Ito sent me an email last night, and he wanted to know whether or not he should be using content encoded or description or C datas or whatever. I go, Man, I don't know. You know, I can tell you kind of what would probably work with my software, but I can't tell you what would work with everybody else's because people are using different methods for doing that stuff. Well, this is a total, total disaster. This stinks. So what I'm trying to promote now is, okay, enough. Let's just, we have one final shot at getting this thing right, okay? Yeah, Sam's shaking his head. Sam and I disagree about this, right? But I think we're going to be having Microsoft in this space and AOL in this space and probably N other big W3C members that love to argue and fight and throw lots of money at this stuff and they never listen to us. And we're going to be dealing with those people pretty soon. And I think that before we deal with them, we ought to try to make this thing really a solid, 
I won't use the word standard, but just something solid where there's a practice that everybody follows and you know you're on solid ground. When you do it that way, you know you're going to work with everybody. And I just think there's been lots and lots of gratuitous incompatibility. People just changing for the sake of changing without any good rationale for doing it. Um, where I come from, you try to follow the trail that was blazed by the person that came before you. you get Sam the microphone. Okay. I shook my head only at one small part. And that Pardon was, me? I shook my head only at one small part. I agree with what you said. You do? Wow. The one small part, I mean, I, I work for IBM. I've been with IBM 21 years. Right. Constantly I hear, we got one shot to get this right. And we fail, and yet life goes on. I never believe that anymore. When I hear okay. somebody say that, that's a nice rallying cry. Yeah, yeah it's a rallying cry. Yeah. You succeed, you fail, life goes on. Oh, yeah. Okay. RSS, for all its warts, is one of the best and most well-supported things that are out there. Yep. Uh, but I want it to be better. I really do. And we'll do that incrementally, and it won't be one shot and get it right. We'll get a little better. But we'll we're at a better. place right now, okay? My feeling is I can arm twist, and I am arm twisting with the other weblog tools vendors, okay? And say that never mind the traditions of RSS which say, uh, you know, all hell breaks loose anytime we want it to, okay? But in the blogging tools market, we have a different ethos, okay? And that ethos is that if you went first, I'm going to do it the way you did it. That worked with the Blogger API. That worked with the MetaWebLog API. That works with Trackback. It should have worked with RSS. And I know these people, and I think they're reasonable people. And I think if I say to them, which I have, hey, you ought to be doing it the way Userland did it, because Userland was doing this long before you were doing it, then you've got to get behind that way. Otherwise, what would you do if Userland changed the Blogger API without talking to you about it? You wouldn't like it, right, Evan? If you were Evan Williams, right? It, that won't work. Um, Trackback, you know, the trots, they changed it. I would have argued with them. Had I been a developer at the time they did change it, I would have argued whether or not they had the right to change that or whether it's advisable to change it. But they changed it. But they changed it, not me. They're the authors of it. They're the, the guardians of it, the guide for that evolution. And that way, we have a chance of trying out new ideas. That's why I implemented Trackback to their spec. And I tested against their application for Interop because I wanted to encourage them to do it again. I wanted them to get, that's why I went for the Blogger API when it came out. Even though I had a much bigger API at that moment. I had the Manila RPC API that was far broader than the Blogger API. I'm talking over everybody's head, no doubt. But much broader, but I said, look, I'd much rather, would I rather have more, and of course we still support, Userland still supports Manila RPC. But um, would I rather have interop in the blogging world, or would I rather have a better API? And my answer was I'd rather have interop. So I went that route. No, you're, you're absolutely right. It's never like we have one final shot. That is a rallying cry, OK? But it would be wonderful, I guess is what I'm really saying, is if we did get sort of that level of compatibility. And the blogging tools market has a shot at doing it because there's a tradition of doing it there. And then, what I was waiting for was for me to have the courage to walk through the flames to say, guys, you screwed up. Let's get this back on track. And then, of course, everybody else can be as innovative with RSS as they want to. But the, the combined power of blogger and movable type and, and user land is pretty good. It's gonna, it, would, it would probably pull through. Yep, there are lots of aggregators. but the, No, I don't agree. I don't think votes matter here. There really isn't a difference between one way or the other. It's not about voting. I mean, at some point, and this is just a difference of opinion, perhaps. Uh, Sam said aggregator people should have a vote. And of course, lots of people feel that they should have a vote. But this is where the standards bodies get lost. I know, we disagree on that. We, you know. I didn't say standards body. Pardon? The, the person who writes NewsGator has got an opinion as to what is a good RSS feed. His opinion is as valid it's as valid. the people who own Radio Userland. He's got a tool, he's a vendor, he sells it for money. There are some RSS feeds that he likes better than others, and he can state why. If you do this, that, and the other, it's better. So I think he should be able to express his opinion and participate equally as much well, as the big three you just mentioned. Okay. Now, I would only take exception with one part of that, okay? Is that, his, first of all, I agree his point of view is valid, okay? Um, and I would add, though, that if we got compatibility between those three tools, then we would be in a position to start talking with this guy about where we go after that. Right now, he has to convince 
three separate people to do it a certain way. No. I don't, well, okay. Let, now maybe we, okay. I think now maybe we've gone a little too far. So, yeah. Can I make a comment about this? I, one of the frustrations I have in working in the open source movement yeah. is that there are a number of people who hate each other. Yeah, you know, I think at this point that's and, where we're talking about here. Oh, okay, and, and, and it's sort of unfortunate. Yeah, that's and, and it's a technique that I think maybe uh, one of the law professors in the room can possibly give us some clues about how it's possible to actually litigate against someone representing your client to the utmost, representing your point of view to the utmost, and walk out of the courtroom afterwards and shake the hand of your opponent because you've conducted a good battle. One of you won, the other one lost, but there will be more battles in the future. We talked about this at lunch yesterday, Larry, you and me, is that, that in the legal profession, there is that tradition. And in the software profession, we haven't gotten there yet. Fully. We should, absolutely. Well, I can tell you one way. It requires that there be a moderator who is not self-interested. That is, this is a dispute, Dave, that you can't moderate. What dispute is it that I'm supposed to be involved in here? Whatever has just erupted here that yeah. I'm still not fully understanding. Yeah, I'm not either. It's, I, it, it, is, it is clear that, that uh, Joe's suggestion, I think, is a good one at this point. That is to see if we can move this one sideways off the agenda what? and maybe then structure something that you're talking about. I won't do Where it. neither of you two is the moderator, but both of you two have the opportunity to speak. That would be the legal law school approach to the problem. You're free to do whatever you want, Trevor, that. Um, I think we better, uh, thank you for your comments. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I think we better, we should end this now. Thanks.